Dogs or cats for you? Cats. Oh. Do you have a cat? Yes. What's the cat's name? Uh, it is Luxie. Okay, Luxie's cute. You've passed, you've done quite well. Thank you for coming. Welcome back to the Futures Edge podcast. I'm Jim Murio. As always, we have Bob Iacino, who's the brains behind the operation and co-host and executive producer. And today's a special show. We have Tracy Shukart, Chief Energy and Material Strategist for Highland. Sorry, high tech. Let's do that whole thing over again. We have Tracy <laughs> Shukart. Chief, by the way, they won't edit even that. They won't edit that. We it's gonna stay don't exactly care. Like that. Right, okay. Hi, Tower. I'm on my own now. I, I know. Yeah, I, I know. It's right in front of me, and I knew it anyway. We have Tracy <laughs> Shukart, Chief Energy and Material Strategist for High Tower Resource Advisors. Thank you for coming, Tracy. Thank you, guys. It's been Clearly a long, from those long windows time waiting. Behind you, you're sitting in a high tower, which is nice. I have a fake background. That's I thought I, you had a fake background. <laughs> okay, good. Because <laughs> it moved around. So it's like, wow, that's so cool. But then it moved. Like you moved and it didn't follow. So I thought it was fake. But anyway, it's good. So anyway, at the beginning of the show, we play the lightning round just to establish credibility, break the ice. You will be asked five random questions that I don't even know what they're going to be. You have five seconds to answer and you will be judged harshly on any bad answers. There's no, yeah, okay. So let's go. First of all, favorite movie. Favorite movie? Um... Poltergeist. You've never thought about this before, ever? Wow. Poltergeist. <laughs> Poltergeist, interesting. Okay, no one said that before. Favorite actor or actress? Um, I don't, these are hard. I don't really watch it's this. Not, you thought it was going to be, okay, fine. We'll switch that question. You get, that's your, okay. You've lived in several places as I've followed you on Twitter. I'm not going to ask you what's your favorite place. What I'm going to say, ask is what month in what place is the best combination of any place you've ever lived? Um, I would say Chicago for sure. And what month? Two thousand eight, and um, August. August, okay. August is a little hot for me. I thought you were going to go with September, Bobby. Didn't you think September is what it was? Yeah, I definitely thought it was going to be September, but I knew it was going to be old Chicago, not current Chicago. Current Chicago is a little different. I still like it, but now it's an acquired taste, and you might have to dodge a bullet here and there. Dogs or cats for you? Cats. Oh, you have a cat? Yes. What's the cat's name? It is Luxie. Okay, Luxie's cute. You've passed. You've done quite well. Thank you for coming. Do you have any <laughs> questions for us before we start? <laughs> As you, we're As good. you can tell, it might be one of the least serious podcasts you've ever been on, but we do get to um, to important things. And having you on, who's someone I look, I always think it's funny, by the way, that my three go-tos in crude oil besides Bob are you, Halima, and Bryn. I think it's pretty cool as the dad of daughters that it's three women. And I'm not trying to be some bullshit feminist, whatever, because I know we don't give a shit about gender, but I think it's neat. Um, you just I don't me a woman, by the way. No, you, well, you're just effeminate, but whatever. I like you either way. <laughs> you have to be overcompensating for something with the tattoos and the trans -ans. Okay, so here, here, I don't want this to devolve in like to bashing the current administration on energy policy. And if you guys know me, that's a complete lie. I absolutely want it to devolve in bashing the current, <laughs> current administration's energy policy. But let's start with just last week, we've had him just threatened to put out of um, put out a commission every coal plant and replace them with a, a team of elves who are going to shuffle their socks on shag carpet and try to get enough static electricity to power people's houses. And then at a, a, a environmentalist speech, he said, "No new drilling." Is, is he? Does he know what he's doing with these things, Tracy? Absolutely not. I think this is the most energy illiterate administration possible. And it's not just him, it's Granholm too, who's just head of um, the EIA. Uh, it's the entire administration. And, and the thing is, is that what the US is trying to do is mimic what Europe has been doing for the last 10 years. And that's going down this energy transition policy without having a backup, right? And so, and we see exactly the disaster that it's having. And forget, forget the Ukraine war at this point, just 
pretend that doesn't exist. Their problem started long before that. Certainly that exacerbated the situation. But if we look back to as early as September of 2021, we started seeing smelters having to shut down because natural gas prices were too high. In fact, by the end of 2021, which was again before the Ukraine invasion, almost 50% of their smelting capacity was offline because it was too expensive and people kind of forget this because all the, the, the whole focus has been on the Ukraine invasion, which again, yes, it exacerbated the problem, but the problem existed well, well before that. What's the answer? Is the energy uh, answer nuclear, like everyone else has been saying? I mean, I think nuclear is great. You're going to have a hard pressed problem trying to convince the West to go nuclear. Yes, they'll, you know, we have seen Germany, for example, um, say that we're going to not shut down, uh, you know, the last three nuclear plants until uh, March. But I, I would expect them to keep pushing that out because. It, it, as soon as we get to 2023, we're going to have a huge nat gas problem. And that's a whole different issue. But, you know, if we look at, if we look at nuclear in particular, you have to, you know, the Fukushima, Chernobyl, every, that, that like spooked the West off nuclear. And yet, you know, yes, I think that's great. But we also have to think about all of our facilities here are aging. They're all 20 to 50 years old. And so if you want to bring on new projects, whether it's in Europe or in the United States, that's going to take a that's going to take 10 years at least to get these projects on board. So yes, I think that's a great solution, but it's not a solution for right this second. So there's been a lot of press about the diesel shortage. And you know, some make it oh, 25 days of diesel supply, which is down from normally 40 days. It doesn't, to me, I've read several different things. It seems bad, but not the end of the world. Can you walk us through that problem and tell me if you agree? So, I mean, if we look at the diesel shortage and it's not only a problem, it's, it's majorly a problem in the US Northeast, right? And that is a, a result of the fact that we have the, oh, only the colonial pipeline going up there, right? And it stops at New Jersey. That leaves the rest of everybody else kind of screwed. <laughs> um, we also had PES refinery shut down, which was 335,000 barrels a day in Pennsylvania a, a couple of years ago. And so we have no refining capacity up there and we have no pipelines up there. And we have environmentalists not wanting any more pipelines or anything like that. We also have a problem with the Jones Act, which the Jones Act specifies that you can only have U.S. vessels coming to, you know, uh, transporting oil, or transporting nat gas or oil products in general um, to, to the U.S., which is what we need to do because Colonial only has a certain amount of capacity. So generally we take ships from the Gulf, we bring them up to the United States. And initially when that's, um, that's a 1920s law. <laughs> and it what, was, what was it for? Why did, they, why did it come about? National oil security at the time. Okay. And that was right around World War One, right? And so yeah. it was a, it was a national oil security time. But at that time, we had 2,500 vessels in the U.S. that were flagged in the U.S. that could bring or you know products, whatever, up to the East Coast. We have 100 vessels now. <laughs> so oh, geez, that's wow. a problem. That's a huge so, problem. So, and so do you think what they what they could? Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I want you. You go. What, what they could do is they don't have to, if, if people are focused on the national security issue, that's fine. But what they could do is just have a waiver, right, for a certain amount of months until um, we get this situation under control. But so one, one more question from me, and then I'll move it over to Bob. When you right. think, like you say, a waiver, and again, Jones Act is point to point, U.S. point to U.S. point. It, it has to be U.S. flagship. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, 
So, and you said they could have a waiver. It seems like it's so simple. It seems like everybody would, would vote for that. It almost, to me, we always argue in the show about incompetence versus nefarious. It almost, or just not giving a shit. Which one is it? Well, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a combination of both because it's a very simple solution. Yeah, it's not a long-term solution, but it is an immediate solution. And so um, immediate's not so bad. The problem is this administration is still not talking about this. And it's not like they haven't done this in the past. They did this for Puerto Rico after the hurricane. They did this, you know, it's not like they haven't issued waivers in the past before they have. And so the fact that this administration is still not talking about this or still not bringing this up, that's a problem. Bobby? Tracy, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So, <laughs> My favorite subject. <laughs> I forgot about I could almost that. just stop right there. I literally Let's don't even have to. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Jimmy always, Jimmy always complains that my questions are more like lectures that end with a fake question. I'll so take just, two naps during his question. <laughs> and I'm just going to ask your, your opinion of these sales based on the fact that the, the SPR is created for uh, emergencies when there are critical under supply of crude oil, whether deliberate or because of natural disaster. And some people argue that that basically is, a, uh, it's always been, it's in the, the uh, actual documentation of the, of the SPR Act, that it is basically to keep prices lower. And that's what this administration is doing by releasing oil from the SPR. I don't agree with that, but what's your take on it? Well, I think I've been pretty vocal about this. Yeah, you have. Um, <laughs> <That's why I laughs> Be again. <laughs> but again, it's for uh, it's for emergency purposes, and you know we're you know we've drained it from over seven hundred and fifty million barrels to I think the last count was three hundred and ninety two million barrels. You know that's that's almost half, right? This it's been the, it's the lowest since nineteen eighty four, so. Uh, the purpose of this is if say we have a, a hurricane like Katrina, when we had when Katrina happened, we had to dig out of the SPR to go help supply that area. And so with everything geopolitically that is going on right now and with all the conflicts that are going on right now, with the tenuous relationship with say um, Saudi Arabia right now, I mean, we need to be careful with our strategic oil reserves. And it's not only that, it's just that the U.S. produces mostly light, sweet crude oil, right? And that's really, you can only produce gasoline from that barrel. That's what comes out of it. So we need heavier crude in order to produce the distillates that we need, <laughs> like diesel, jet fuel, kerosene, et cetera, <laughs> right? And we've been draining the SPR of mostly heavy crude oil, the kind we don't produce. And this is where it becomes a significant problem that people- See, a lot of people don't know that. That's brilliant. Right? And so this is where it becomes a significant problem because you know we mostly get our heavier crude oil from Canada, um, which we, we all know the problems there. Keystone was canceled, et cetera, et cetera. We get some from Mexico, um, but their production is not looking that great. Um, we used to get some from uh, Russia, but it was like it was like thick sludgy, thick sludgy oil. But at least it was something that we could mix. Now you know we have a Russian oil embargo. That's fine. So that's six hundred thousand barrels per day. That, that's off the market right now. And so we have a serious problem with heavier crude oil and trying to get that. And, and that's what we're draining from the SPR. And so this, this is a problem that people okay. don't realize. So, so tell me this, do you, like when you were talking now, let's break it into the price of crude, crude market. So it sounds to me like you're saying $100 crude, right? What the time frame? What, what are you thinking? I think eventually, I, I think we could see that again. Of course, we did see that earlier in the year with a, a war premium, you know, in February when there was an invasion, we did see that that did come off some. Um, but I think as soon as, you know, and we are already starting to see these SPR releases dwindle, right? 
you know, we went from like 8 million barrels a week to 3.6 million, and that's going to taper off unless they issue a whole nother slew of, uh, <laughs> of releases. And so I think that, and then we also have to look at the fact that December 5th, we have the EU oil and product embargo, and that's actually going to exacerbate the diesel problem even more because uh, EU actually- can, can you explain what the EU embargo is on December 5th? Like, I don't um, know. Oh, so on December 5th, there's an EU embargo, not on natural gas, because they still do get some natural gas, um, but it is on oil and oil products. And from so, Russia. From Russia. And so <clears throat> what that entails is that mostly the products that they buy is, is diesel. <laughs> From, from from Russia. And so that's going to put a crunch on the diesel problem even more because the diesel problem mostly exists in the West. And, you know, it's mostly Europe and the United States right now. And so we have to look um, to see how this embargo really starts it, it affecting um, the, the global market. I mean, okay. I know... I don't think it's going to totally take barrels off the market, right? They're going to find, Russia's going to find other markets, India, China, um, even Japan, which is a member of the G7, still is buying from Russia and said they still will continue to buy from Russia. And so it's not a, it's, you know, this decision is not a global decision. Everybody has to kind of remember that is when we're talking about global oil flows is that not everybody has an embargo. Okay, so so no my... barrels of Russian crude oil have been off the market yet, right? Almost none. Almost none. And I, and I kind of said that at, at, at the very beginning when this happened, and we, you had a lot of uh, other firms coming out and saying three to four million barrels are going to be taken off the market immediately, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, there's no way because there's other buyers. You know, if you look to India or whatever, you, you know, India... Uh, no, oil prices are so high right now. Anybody, any emerging market right now wants to buy at a discount. And when that first happened, I mean, Russian oil was at a $30 discount to Brent. Who wouldn't buy that, right? Because you're suffering. And you, also have, the a, and you also have a dollar, the dollar, you know, exploding. That means your currency is worth, and you're having to buy oil in dollars. And so it was especially tough on uh, emerging markets when all that happened. So, of course, they're going to buy oil because India even said as late as COP27, you know, we're still going to buy from Russia because we're more concerned about our energy security than what the United States is. It's another one of those things where it just sounds good. We'll embargo embargo Russian oil. Yeah, but a lot of people are going to suffer. It's absolutely asinine. Let's change this real quick to the CPI number that came out yesterday, because I've been talking and Bobby will verify this. I thought the inflation numbers were going to roll over. You know, global shipping rates coming down, lots of key commodities coming down, except for one, but crude and diesel and gasoline. So when you look at the commodity picture in general, there's everything. There's lumber, there's copper, there's oil, but then there's crude. Crude and Crude basically makes up about probably 20 to 30 percent of the whole commodity picture when you're talking about the cost of everything. It dwarfs the importance of any other commodity. That's correct, right? Well, absolutely. You can't do anything without oil, right? right. You can't manufacture anything. You can't uh, dig for metals. You can't. You can't do anything without crude. It, it makes the world. You know, without energy, you can't do anything with any any other commodity. You can't. You can't farm. You can't. You know, right. so, of course. So not the fairy unicorn dust or whatever the hell that the administration is trying to get us to use. That that doesn't work is what we're saying. Because I'm I'm shocked and frankly I'm offended. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's weird. I know it's weird. It's but, weird. but we need a lot of fossil fuels if you want to get your EVs and your EV batteries and your EV metals and etc. Me, you know. Yeah, of course. So let's talk about that then. Let's branch into a, about a month ago. I gave a speech at the New Orleans Investment Conference and the whole punch of it was, and Bobby, you know I'm going to keep patting myself on the back for this shit too. I it was, actually going, wasn't going to stay it this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'll nice. take the words right out of your mouth. Tracy's so nice. I wasn't going to actually stay. You're going to bring that shit up again? <laughs> okay, but, I, but I'm right and getting writer. 
the copper market was trash. They talk about their decarbonization of the future. There's no decarbonization that happens without copper. And we're already at copper deficits. We already have the environmentalists so badly wanting everything EV, but so badly wanting no more extraction anywhere, including around the world. You study copper markets as well, I assume. Give me your take. Walk us through what you think of copper for the next six months, year, five years. That's the problem. I mean, I, longer term, obviously, it, it's a buy. First of all, we're already in a market deficit. It's ridiculous. Even China, China, who, <laughs> who just lies, Trump, China lies about China. it. <laughs> Lies about it. I love how she said it disgustedly. Like, it's like China. <laughs> well, because, you know, I mean, first of all, there's two factors of this. First of all, China's inventories are way down, right? And they've actually admitted that, which is odd because earlier this year, they just got caught lying about their inventories. And a bunch of firms got shut down because they were over exaggerating you know, um, their inventories and people obviously were hedged on that, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a whole big thing. So now they're back to admitting their inventories are at the lowest they've been in the last 10 years. <laughs> um, and they're looking to, you know, they want to invest more in, in uh, those metals, likely going to Africa, I'm sure, because- yeah. That's what they do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we have LME inventories down. We have COMEX inventories down. I mean, we have, we just don't have enough. And in fact, even if we, every mine produced that we have now at the max capacity, we still wouldn't have enough. We need 20 more mines the size of that just to get us to 2035, which we don't have because there's... The, the 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 mining industry suffers the same problem that the oil industry does is the last seven years there's been no capex exactly. and a lot of mining equipment jimmy runs on solar and wind just so you know i mean it's oh, all the time that's what they do and wind. right yes so you can course, easily man. build electric cars by powering it with copper drilled from solar i'm sorry i'm i'm beating a dead horse here no but bob i want to ask a question but i did want to tell because people who, who view this podcast and people who see me on twitter know that the copper things that drum up and beat yeah, for a month a i have been talking about that for a long long time yeah, and over the last couple of weeks, I have been systematically increasing my position in copper. I Again, I don't even think of this as a trade necessarily, and I haven't done it in futures yet. I, I think of this as more like this is something I want to have, you know, 5% of my dough in for the next five to 10 years, maybe even more than that. But Bobby, look, you got a question? I do. I wonder if Tracy could explain something to people, which I don't think is, uh, hang on, cheers, which I don't think is... Uh, clear to a lot of people is why the winter matters so much for diesel because uh, the whole distillates thing distillates right now are 17 percent according to the last cia report 17 percent below the five-year average and i don't think people understand that di distillates are made heating oil and diesel are made at the same time for the most part um, so if there's a bigger demand for heating oil there's a bigger demand for diesel plus i worked at tracy i worked at a, a boutique oil firm in chicago for about four years doing uh, ge geopolitical strategy and hedging strategies for them in the energy markets. And one of the things I learned there, which I always love to bring up because it's something that Jimmy doesn't know. And I think that's amazing. That makes me really happy when I'm smarter than Jim. <laughs> is the speed crude oil goes through a pipeline. Even though we don't have pipe, you can't increase the speed even if we had more pipe. So I remember we had a, we had a, a barge of crude oil up near Canada and we were trying to get rail cars and there were no rail cars available. And I said to the CEO at the time, because I didn't know, I said, can we just like commission a rail car? He goes, it's like 18 months and millions of dollars to build them. You just can't because of the EPA regulations. Right. So I think people don't, you know, you mentioned that crude oils and everything. I don't think people realize how important diesel specifically is and the mix with heating oil. Oh, absolutely. It runs the economy. How do you get, how do you get freight to move, right? How do you get, um, your shit from Amazon every day. From what, well, you just swore on our podcast. How dare you? Oh my you? God. Anyway, go <laughs> Sorry. I said I might do that. It was an accident. Yeah, we will not <laughs> fucking so bleep that out, just so you know. <laughs> God damn it, Tracy. But anyway. But yeah. I mean, really, diesel is the heartbeat of the economy. How do you get anything? It's basically moved by 
trucking or freight or container ships, whatever that basically use, uh, obviously vessels use, um, you know, marine oil, but, but it's, it does it, it's a derivative of, it's a, it's a distillate. It's a distillate, right? right. I mean, you're so at a distillate that's how oil. you get everything, right? How are you going to get your stuff mm -hmm. from China moved to the U.S.? On a vessel that's using, you know, marine fuel oil, right? Or how are you going to get that off the dock and to you, off the dock in LA and to you in New York? A, tr a truck. I have an I have <laughs> an environmentalist. I have an environmentalist friend, and I don't use environmentalist as a dirty word. Jimmy's one. His daughter's one. But I don't use that as a dirty word. But I have an environmentalist friend who I told him I said, you realize crude oil specifically from areas of North and Northwest and, and other places are being moved in trucks because the Keystone was killed. They're being moved in trucks that burn diesel down to refineries. So it's like they're, they're burning the fuel, they're driving the derivative or the, the origin of that fuel down to make because we don't have a pipeline. I know. Well, it just, but it's I've, actually I've, more dangerous if you think about it, rail and trucking. It's actually a more dangerous way to move that kind of fuel. Clearly. Right? How many train accidents do you see? How uh, many pipelines? Lot. Head on collisions. Anyway. It's, it's amazing. And, and Tracy, to his point, my daughter's studying, she's getting her uh, master's in environmental engineering at Stanford right now. She worked in the business, she was an Illinois engineer. And um, I, I argue with her all the time because I believe that. If you look at the environment, the most damage ever done to the environment was clearly industrialists, number one. Following second to me is environmentalists who've done some bullshit things in the name of good over the years. And this is one of the things, like you just said, like, okay, they stopped the pipeline and they never for one second think about what the ramifications of those things are. Unintended consequences. We all do that. But let's talk about the CPI number from yesterday. And this is going to be a question for both you guys. I thought it was a big deal. I thought we were going to see inflation rolling over. The only wild card I thought was energy, and I think it still exists. And I think the stock market, I think the whole bear thing is over. Technically, that makes sense to me, too, with a new weekly high, and I assume we're settling there. Uh, we're taping this, by the way. And this is actually 3.05 on Friday when I'm saying this right now. Do you think the episode of inflation is over? Um, do you think the supply chain is healing slowly and gently? Tracy, you first. Ooh. Man, um, I think inflation is still going to be sticky because I still think that we're going to have problems in the metals market because I think looking out to 2023, remember how energy was kind of the big deal this year? I think 2023, it's going to be metals and we're going to see prices rise because- My copper trade, woo! <laughs> because, because, you know, the West is sticking with these plans, you know, these- uh environmental plans we're not getting away from evs or whatever they don't really care what happens every government is kind of pushing forward this we don't have enough metal so i think 2023 is going to be like those base and industrial metal kind of uh kind of trade just like this year uh, ener energy was so i think inflation is going to be sticky what i really would look at and what i'm looking at closely is u.s dollar right because we've seen that pull back a lot we saw that thursday we had a puke from like 110 to 107. I think a lot of people got stopped out when that broke kind of the support area. I think people got scared. And I think that, you know, we saw a big uh, pullback again today. And I think that's because, you know, people exiting out of the markets. I think FTX thing might have something to do with it. I don't really know the mechanics of how the crypto markets work, but I know that USD is involved in there somehow. So I think part, part of that, there's some part of liquidation there, um, you know, and as well, you know, um, when the FTX thing happened in general, we saw the broader, we saw a lot of deleveraging because we saw big guys like, you know, BlackRock and uh, SoftBank and um, Ontario Pension Fund and Tiger Global, and all these big guys that were exposed to the market. And, you know, when that news kind of hit earlier in the week, we saw a big dive in the markets because we saw some deleveraging. And then um, I think when we had that CPI release in the market, you know, ripped a hundred points. <laughs> I think some people got caught off sides a little bit. Do you think? I, before I fast Bobby, because I want, 
I want you to answer too, but I want to underscore two things that Trace just said. She casually mentioned the fact that governments around the world don't care that they're driving up energy prices. They genuinely don't give a shit. And then she mentioned the Sam Bankman feed thing and, and BlackRock and whatever. I don't give a shit when a fool in their money part. I mean, I think there's a beauty to it. The only thing I like about rates being what I think are potentially too high is that you pull back the wallpaper and see where the holes in the wall are. You see who the moron's on. And if Tom, if Tom Brady lost $655 million, like is being portrayed, I, I've enjoyed watching him play football, but I, I don't give a crap. A fool and his money are soon to part. If I said anything bad, Bob, or no? No. And, and honestly, like one of the things about Jimmy Tracy, I don't know if you know this, but he's very consistent. I mean, he's always, <laughs> he is. He is. He's very, he enjoys <laughs> others' pain. He's, uh, he's been I do not. That's that. not true. He's I just been think clear it's about true. that. Um, no, look, from a perspective of, of inflation, um, you know, one, one of the members, we do these daily webinars for our members uh, at Path Trading Partners that we have. And one of our members, literally for the last eight months, has been saying uh, pause is guaranteed, a pivot is guaranteed with the Fed, right? He's just, a, he's a permable. And, you know, I said to him the other day, I, I said, it's like saying snow is guaranteed in Chicago. It's like 70 something in Chicago right now. And I'm like, I guess like snow is guaranteed tomorrow. Snow is guaranteed tomorrow. Keep saying it. The Fed wasn't gonna raise rates, not only at 75 basis points, but at all into infinity. They were obviously at some point going to pause. What I think people don't understand to me about inflation is it's always going up. It's an index. When you look at CPI, pull up a, a maximum CPI at the Fred website, St. Louis Fred website. It's this. It is straight up the whole time. There's a dip for each recession, and then it's straight up. And there's a difference between disinflation and deflation. Disinflation is what we saw in the last set of numbers right? A reduction of the increase in prices at rate. What we don't actually want to see is deflation because that then gets, it's just like, you know, I'm doing one of those things, Tracy, Jim says I always do. But, you know, if we have deflation, it's similar to like when we all saw big screen TVs at $12,000 each, ah, they'll come down. Then they came down to 8,000. We're like, they might come down a little more and you don't spend. That's deflation. So people actually pull back during deflation and they don't spend. It's a horrible economic condition. My issue is this. We had commodities, including crude oil drop, right? In this past CPI number, you know what actually increased? Services. And Services. Services. Yeah. Went from 3.8 last month to 3.9 this month. What is one of the stickiest part of inflation? Services. 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 So... What happens if crude oil starts creeping up, which it's been doing? What happens if your copper trade is right earlier than you think and it starts going up? It now joins with services inflation and we see that in those inflation numbers come right back up. My issue is, does the Fed see year over year inflation at four and a half percent as a victory? Do we see it as a victory? Before, before I pass that to Tracy, I will add that the rents are going to plummet. I will add that supposedly 49% of restaurants are late on rent payments right now, 35% of small businesses in general. I do think there's two sides of this equation. Tracy, take a look at that. Oh, yeah. no, no, I absolutely agree with you. And that's what I meant about kind of sticky inflation where we're going to see stagflation, even though everybody hates the word stagflation, but we're going to see inflation higher in certain areas. It's just a fact. As we see with higher rates, as we see demand destruction in other areas, such as um, housing and rents, et, et cetera, right? And the weird, the, the anomaly that services is, is that we still have pent up demand, which is <laughs> crazy, yeah, crazy. From, from, you know, COVID lockdowns. I mean, there's literally, I mean, Looking out into the H1 of 2023, I mean, cruise lines are booked. People are still traveling. Airline, I mean, it's 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 nuts. Even yeah, though people, it, so people have money, want to spend it. Can I add something to that, Jim? Please, to what Tracy just said. Yeah. So, stagflation and, and Jimmy and I, you know, I've been talking about this, and you've agreed with me, by the way. I don't think any Fed governor wants to go down as the Fed governor that lost in the fight to inflation. And stagflation is a worse economic condition than inflation or recession. 
if we get to a point of stagflation, which your, your comment, Jimmy, struck me about the small business being laid on their rent, do rents plummet, they catch up, or do rents plummet because they close? I, I think it's probably a little bit of both, but I think that number is going to go down in part because businesses will close and now we're in stagflation and how do you get out of that? So I think we've had 10 years of zero interest rates, right? Why do people think we can't have five, six years, 6%, 5%? Because I don't think so, because I believe, you know, it, 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 Tracy, I have a restaurant too, by the way, Brant's Palatine, and that's so I'm plugged into the restaurant business too. I, I fully believe that our economy completely collapses if rents are too high for too long, and things have changed over the last 20, 25, 30 years, is that over-regulation, almost punitive taxation, had to be accompanied by inorganically low rates or else the house of cards falls in. There is nobody who's lined up to decrease regulation and uh, you know open up lines of, of trade like Reagan was. I think that rates have to come back down. Tracy, thoughts? Well, I, I think that, I think eventually rates will have to come back down. What I think is more important is that I think the Fed is going to have to move their 2% um, goal really to start to accept 4%. That might be <laughs> that the sort of, I think that's the middle ground that Jim and I don't have right now because they can't get to 2%, not unless they no, leave rent. I, I might not be disagreeing with you. That's a work in progress in my head. That might be yeah, big too. I, the thing that always strikes me about the inflation argument too is that the psychology of it, like people are like, inflation is not going away. And what they really mean is those high prices aren't going away. Yeah. And like you said before, you know, those prices aren't going to come back down, nor should we necessarily want them to come back down. Maybe some of the broth being knocked out a little bit too. Tracy, towards like this show, we break up, you're on for sure, the, the macro guest is on, we talk, and then we break into trades using uh, CME products. We want, I want you to stay on, particularly if you're going to call one of us an idiot um, when we give our trades out, <laughs> because we like that kind of talk. Will you stay with us or you can right. go too if you want? I'll stay on for the trade portion. Let's do it. Good. Good, Bobby. Can I go for it with my trade? Yeah, please, I'm, I'm only going to recap a trade, so you go ahead. Can I get go my ahead, chart oh. back up first? <laughs> <laughs> get your drink um, in the picture. Get your yeah. Um, oh, by the way, my two trades from last week was one was the long gold, one was the short ten year yield contracts. Both of them are working beautifully. Um, these trades are going to be similar right now. My theme is not changing. We never talked about silver in this, and I think silver is an interesting trade right now. Um, I'm looking, and again, I'm, I'm not going to be putting this down in the futures and everybody who follows me knows why I'm uncomfortably long silver in some other trades, but a, a trade back down to 2120 when I was mapping this out a couple hours ago, I think it rallied hard in the close. So this might not even ever happen, but a pullback to 2120, to so spot to buy the micro, uh, micro December silver contract CME with a target of 2280 on the upside and a stop placed below 2025. This is a, I'm placed at 2025. This is the stop level. Like at first I thought 20 was the level. 21 to me seemed the level that when it took it out, um, a settle above it seemed very bullish technically to me. This trade, if you take it up to the target, make 1600 bucks on the micro for one contract. If you take it down and get stopped out, it's 950. Which, by the way, the micro silver contract is still kind of big. It's only one fifth of the main contract, it's a thousand ounces. Um, thoughts on it, Tracy? Silver. Uh -huh. On oh, silver, okay. I actually, um, I actually got long um, SLV calls um, December sixteenth at twenty two last month. So oh, good. I kind of like what, what's the duration? What's the, when do the calls expire? Uh, December. Oh, okay. Oh, the December calls. You said that. Okay, I forgot my month. <laughs> December calls. Yeah. Yes. Okay, right. I thought you got long in December. I was like, was that SLB 22 expir expiry is December. Okay, so that's yeah, means but, you were, so I did get that. Yeah. So I, I I was already kind of you know because when we're talking about silver, is that not only is it a precious metal, but it also has um, uh, industrial applications. So if we're looking at solar panels and windmills and things like that, there, there's a, there's a lot of those metals in that. So it's kind of one of those. Uh, cross metals, even though it's been beaten up forever. <laughs> but I think it will gain more and more importance as we're looking to expand solar capacity, et cetera, et cetera, because new solar 
new solar panels actually require twice the amount of silver that solar panels did just 10 years ago. So. Wow. See, I'm so glad you're on the show. Thank you for this, brother. And Bob, before you comment too, I want you to throw in the fact that, because I do want the opinion of both of you, the fact that crypto has been absolutely caned, absolutely pummeled, is that going to be put a shot in the arm of, of uh, precious metals as well, Robert? I say yes. Uh, first of all, I, I think we saw that. We actually saw on the risk asset sell-off a couple of days ago that gold held in better than anything when crypto was absolutely getting crushed on the first news of the FTX problem. And now we've got Tether kind of breaking. If you know anything about crypto, and I've been saying for a while, both here and on my TV appearances, that I need Tether to clear out before I get any crypto uh, exposure again. And I need to see how that plays out and clears out and tether seems to be breaking. But anyway, when we had sort of that fear in the market on the, on the crypto situation, gold was actually positive during that af at risk asset sell-off for the longest period of time of any of the assets on that day. I love your silver trade. I love it because we have two consecutive um, uh, closes now above the 200, two consecutive daily closes above the 200. And today pulled back below the 200. And even though we it closed lower than silver's open, it's still closed above that 200. Now the 200 is very flat right now, but it's still the 200. You know, it's one of those things. It's like when Walter Payton was really old, he was still Walter Payton. You know, you still yeah. had to be careful. So that's how I feel about the 200 day moving average. So I like this trade a lot. I don't think you got it. Um, your entry was 20. 2120. It was, it was 2120. I'm not going to get it out. 2135 was, is the lowest. I mean, we're closed basically. So, yeah, whatever. I but still got a lot of silver. Pullback, Jimmy, your setup of a pullback is perfect for where you put it. I like to trade a lot. Bobby, but before we go into the, my next trade, you want to go into your crude? Yeah. So two By the way, ago. I will add something real quick. I'm sitting here and there's some guy walking around on my roof. And now I've just decided I think he's cleaning my gutters. But I really should know what the hell is going around this house because I was freaked out for a second there. So anybody that knows you knows you know you're <laughs> like five feet around you and your wife has the rest. Everybody and, and the rest. One time I posted a picture of my back lawn and someone like was like, wow, what a great yard you have. How do you keep it looking so good? I'm like, I don't know. How, how do lawns work? Like who cuts grass and stuff? I don't, I don't know how that works. <laughs> so, but anyway, <laughs> Bobby. Yeah, so two weeks ago, um, I, I wasn't on the podcast last week, and I don't have a fresh trade for this week, only because I've been dealing with some personal issues that I told you guys earlier, but um, I bought crude oil. Um, I bought the crude oil futures contract, and I bought it at about 85.70, okay? Uh, my stop was at 80.54. This is micro crude. Again, I would not have done this trade had I not been able to do it in micro crude because in full crude, it would have been too much risk, right? It would have been $5,700 or so approximately of risk per contract, which is just, it's out of what I allot to crude. But having said that, my stops at 80.54, we didn't get anywhere near there. Uh, lowest level we got on the pullback was like 84.70. And now we're moving back my way. Uh, but my target is 96.44. Now, I first the trade itself, Tracy and Jim, and then my sort of overall thesis. My overall thesis is actually $65 before 105. Now this will probably be the last week that I say that because it's just <laughs> to me, the dynamic has been changing. I said that about a month ago. I stuck with it because not, it had not put a floor. Changed. If I didn't put a floor under it, it's 70. So it's yeah, <laughs> I know, I know that, but he's so I almost said he's so dumb. I would have meant it. Um, he's so- uh, uh, I'm so, so glad you did. Not, what do I want to say? <laughs> what I'm trying to say is like his floor won't work. Anyway, I, I was actually encouraged for my original thesis by a lot of the comments on the OPEC Plus members this week. Um, some of the conversations they're having with their Asian clients, prices are too high, blah, blah, blah. They might add more production. I don't think that'll happen. But my current trade is for a 96.44 target before an $80 and 50 some odd cents stop. If we get into the uh, mid, if we get into the low nineties, I'll move that stop up. What do you guys think? I'm still in it, so. I, I, I like it, it. Tracy. Uh, I like it. I have uh, September 2023, $100 calls. $100 calls or 2300 calls? No. <laughs> <laughs> She bought 20 of the $300. They can't be that expensive. Then we're never driving again. They can't be that expensive. <laughs> oh, no. So September, so you got like five, September four or five months. September 2023, you 23. Yeah. $100. <laughs> 
<laughs> Good. You guys. Good. <laughs> I agree with Tracy. I, well, actually, Bobby, you now too. But when you used, were saying 65, I don't know. It seemed to me that um, there was just too much lined up against it. So I, I, I like yeah, the I trade a lot. But again, I'm liking every trade right now that favors weaker dollar, a Fed that might be backing off a little bit. That's going to be my next trade as well, but I'm not going to get to see it. And by the way, for those of you guys who watch the show, a lot of times I play upside in uh, the stock market with those imbalanced call flies, like a 70 tick wide call versus a 40 tick wide call. And I love those trades and I think I'm smarter than everybody. And I hate the fact that they don't perform well when we just absolutely shoot higher like we have the last two days and I'm making money, making money, then losing money, losing money. I'm like, wait, I'm no genius. This is idiotic. And then I have to rebalance it. And that's happened to me on several of these trades the last couple of days. Now, that being said, I'm a bull of the stock market now. I said a, a close, a, a weekly close above 38.25 and then a follow through on a weekly. We've gotten it this week. Um, I'm a bull. I think the... I again, I think the bear market is over. Like a lot of people, are like, oh, you're making this big, huge call. No, I don't bet the whole farm on it. You guys are, I mean, we're risk mitigation people. We're not Sam Bankman, whatever the hell his name is. We don't put everything in one pocket. So I think the bear market is over. I think at a pullback to 3940, which at the time I was writing this out, I thought it was going to get, it also doesn't seem like it's going to happen if the market continued rallying as we started this show, which looked like it was going to. Pullback to 3940 was a spot to buy it with a target of 41. 10 and then a stop out place back below 3840. So I guess we're just talking theoreticals here about the direction of the short term because it's not the actual trade's not gonna happen. Tracy, do you like upside in the stocks? I I like upside again, you know, um, I'm at 4106. I think you could you could possibly see before we see a meaningful pullback in this market. That's your level. That's your level that you have. My level is forty one oh six to watch. If we start, there was a moment I was if terrified. We start moving above. Saying, if we okay. start moving above that, I get scared. Okay. <laughs> then I. Well, think I thought you meant that, that was last trade for a second. I haven't been watching my computer for forty five minutes. Like, what'd you say? Forty one oh six. That's where we're at right now. No, we're not. Okay, no, good. that's the level I'm watching. Perfect. <laughs> if we get higher, I mean, we could shit the bed tomorrow. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, well, but that's, I think that's a, you know, that's like the 200 day. If we start moving above that, then we break that sort of, uh, you know, wedge, that downtrend wedge, technically speaking. Robert? So I like to trade in the short term. I said at the end of September, I thought the fourth quarter was going to be positive. So bold of a call considering how weak the third quarter was, right? I mean, just brave, brave, brave. <laughs> but I, I agree with Tracy that I think we might, I'm a little nicer than her. We might poo-poo the bed. Um, <laughs> my, my, my thing is this. I think that, so obviously Jimmy's talking about a short-term trade because if he thinks the bull market is over, he wouldn't be targeting only a few points from here, right? He'd be targeting new all-time highs. But I think that the fourth quarter is going to continue to have strength because A, I think people think they understand what the Fed is going to do and they've accepted it. And so that's theory, it's moment from a momentum perspective priced in. And we've gotten our first uh, reasonably weak inflation indicator. Even though all the Fed speakers are saying this is not a pause, they'll likely slow the rate of rate increases, right? I, I believe this is the long road to I like this trade, Jim. So I'll mm -hmm. just stop. I, I think the first <laughs> quarter of next year and the second quarter of next year are going to be really, really hard for the stock market. Because okay. now we're we're shifting from what's the Fed going to do to rates to how the hell are we getting out of this recession? That's mm -hmm. what we're going to be shifting to next year. Now, stock markets do rally during recessions, but they don't rally during stagflation. That's the kicker. So if we can't get inflation under control, not good for equities. Tracy, last word on the markets? Yeah, no, I also think that you have to look at the last quarter of the year, all these portfolio managers, haven't made money all year, right? They're coming up like what, uh, November, what is it 16th or the 21st? I forget the date where they figure out whether they have clients or not left. <laughs> so I think, I, I think that, you know, they're doing what, whatever they can to help push up the market. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, so it's it. Friday. What city do you live in now, Tracy? I am in Fort Lauderdale. 
Are you really you lucky bastard? What what is a Friday night for trade? Like, is there a favorite bar you go to? Uh, what are you gonna do? Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to my beach bar and like kind of just chill. <laughs> watch watch the ocean. I mean, the the, hur the mini hurricane is over. So, you know, it's nice and sunny today. So, Jimmy, is what that, will you? What, is hmm? that little beach with the duck boats in Arlington Heights near 355 open for you or not? That, that Lake Arlington? The little right? Lake Arlington <laughs> duck boat beach. Yeah, yeah, is that no, open yeah, for yeah. you? By the way. The we, we great can, too, though. Come on. Chuck, yeah, well, I was going to say, we can bash Chicago all we want. There's some fabulous beaches. They're just not fabulous now. And by the way, it was 75 yesterday, but it's going to be like 35 today. So, Oak, Street, uh, think, Oak Street Beach. You can go to the it's beach. It's great. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. What's our uh, last question? What are you going to drink? You walk up to the bar tonight. What's your first drink? Uh, uh, wine. I'll have a. Uh, I like wine. Yes, I'm saying. Can't lose. Something, Can cold, I recommend something cold and white. Out of Moldova. <laughs> Putin hasn't invaded here yet, so get this one. <laughs> Was that from the convenience store in the hotel or no? <laughs> Actually, it's we had this at the house. We buy all the half bottles of wine we can so that when we drink seven of these, we'll be like, it was only a half bottle. Yeah, we it's don't only a half bottle. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. All right. I'm leaving. I'm going to take a nap, and then I'm going to go to my bar because I just got a text that we're down employees tonight. So I'll That's be hosting. Weird. That never yeah, happens. Down boys thank all you now. guys. This is so much fun. Thank you, Tracy. Tracy thanks thank for, you so uh, much. Thanks for putting up with us. Appreciate it very much. Have a great night, you guys. Thanks. Cheers.